in the last however many years? Yes. I was like, what's the population growth been? And he told me that uh, in the last 10 years, the county's population has grown by 43%. I mean, that's, uh, that's incredible. I know there's good and bad that come with that because you get traffic and stuff, but I think it just shows you that um, people vote with their feet. Obviously, people have come to Florida, but they look to St. John's County as a, as a high quality of life. And part of that is because I think that, that you have really good law enforcement that are working really hard to keep everybody safe. And that's part of the reason why we're here today to be able to sign a couple really good pieces of legislation. But before we do that, I wanna recognize everybody who was with us. Uh, we do have our commissioner for the state Florida Department of Law Enforcement, uh, Mark Glass, of course. We have Sheriff Hardwick from St. John's County Sheriff's Office. We have representatives Duggan, Rizzo, Payne, and Leak. Uh, all but Rizzo are from this general area. Uh, Rizzo is joining us all the way down from Miami, Florida for this, so that's great. And then we're going to hear from Deputy Marquise Davis Welsh, who works here at the St. John's County Sheriff's Office. Uh, we've developed a track record in Florida of supporting law enforcement that is quite simply second to none. Uh, we understood how important it is to have safe communities. And the way you do that is to support the people that are putting the uniform on and risking their lives to keep us safe. Uh, this became all important that we took that very clear position when four or five years ago you started to see movements to defund law enforcement. You saw a lot of attacks waged against law enforcement. And you really saw law enforcement be a job that a lot of people in many of these jurisdictions said, hey, this is a thankless thing. They had dedicated their careers to it, and they had enough, and then they, they've leave. So we saw that uh, as actually an opportunity for the state of Florida, given our posture was much different. And so a couple years ago, we enacted $5,000 recruitment bonuses for new law enforcement officers. Some of that is recruiting from other states, but also young people that decide to go into the profession in Florida are are eligible for it as well, and, and we've had success in both of those. Uh, but if you think about uh, from, so the total bonus program I'm gonna announce in a second, uh, but you know, we've had people from 49 different states come to Florida to join law enforcement at the, at the municipal, county, or state level, including more than 400 from three states alone. Could you guess them? California, Illinois, and New York. And, um, and if you think about what's happened around the country, some of these areas, St. Louis Police Department, all-time low in terms of the number of officers. Chicago, 1,600 fewer officers than they had in January of 2019. Of course, New York City, averaging 200 officers leaving the force every month. That's not by accident. Uh, they're doing that because they don't have the support of the community. A lot of these politicians weaponize against them. And a lot of the laws are so lax that it gives the criminals the advantage to be able to commit crimes really without major repercussions. And so our bonus program has been successful. In fact, I can say that very soon, because you know this stuff happens on a daily basis, but, but probably by the end of this month, uh, we will have hit 5,000 officers who have qualified for our $5,000 bonus program. And that's a big, big deal, and it's made a big, big difference. And of course, that's after taxes, and so uh, whatever we're paying is more than that, and then they net $5,000, which is really, really important. So we've distributed $32 million to date in that program. The legislature has continued to fund that in this year's budget. We're still going through the budget, and we'll, we'll finish that uh, hopefully in the not-too-distant future. But I can tell you the $17 million that the legislature has put to continue our bonus program for law enforcement officers has been approved. And so we're going to have that for, for one more year, and that's really, really significant. Uh, we've also done things to ensure that um, uh, local governments – now, St. John's County would not do this, uh, but, you know, we've got a big, diverse state. Uh, any municipality could have a handful of people on a city council that would do dumb things. So we, uh, several years ago, enacted a policy to block local governments at the municipal and county level from defunding the police. Uh, we think it's an insane policy. We don't think people should be... We don't think people should... Um, why would you want to defund 
a police canine. I mean, come on. Uh, we don't think that they should be doing, um, we don't think there's a justification for it. And what happens is they do this, and when they've done this, they, they even the really uh, anti-police jurisdictions have had to reverse because it's, it's so crazy. So we don't want to put in a situation where any of our citizens are put at risk because you may have a handful of yahoos do something really stupid. So we're uh, uh, the first state in the country to, to stop that in its tracks, and that's been very, very successful. Uh, we've also introduced law enforcement education uh, initiatives in our high schools. And so each school district now is encouraged to establish public safety telecommunications training programs, as well as law enforcement officer explorer programs in the public schools. And part of that is, you know, you go, you students can go, they can come to a sheriff's department, they can meet people who are doing this, and you know, some students may have a different understanding of this uh, prior to seeing that firsthand experience. And so I think what it's done is it actually causes some students to want to get involved in law enforcement because they see everybody working hard and, and, and how uh, gratifying that can be. Uh, we've also created the Florida Law Enforcement Academy Scholarship Program. So that's tuition, fees, and up to $1,000 of eligible education expenses for trainees enrolled in a law enforcement officer basic retreat training program. You know, we do things like Bright Futures for, for college education. Uh, so this is kind of the law enforcement answer to that. Uh, we've also made uh, dependent children of law enforcement officers eligible to receive the school choice scholarships uh, to attend the school of their choice. Now, that was important when we did it. Now we've done so much school choice that pretty much everyone is, is covered at this point. But still, I think that that was something that a lot of people really, really appreciated. And it shows that we appreciate the service. Uh, where crime right now in the state is at a 50-year low. And that only happens when you have people that are wearing the uniform uh, that are keeping people safe. Uh, if you don't support them, if, you, if they feel like they're under the gun, you are going to see crime rise. That's just the nature of it. Uh, so we have a uh, overall crime down nearly 10 percent year over year, uh, murder down 14, burglary down 15 percent, robbery down 17 percent. And look, we do good stuff uh, at the state with policy. That's important. If you have the bad policy, I mean, if there are no cash bail and they're releasing people all the time, you could be the best police officer in the world, have the best force, you're going to, uh, the thumb's going to be on the scale against you. So, so our role has been important and we're proud of that, but ultimately uh, here is where uh, the rubber meets the road. And we have, uh, we have the best law enforcement officers in America in the state of Florida. So we're proud of that. Now, another thing that we did was uh, recognize that our canines are part of ensuring law and order, and we wanted to make sure, and unfortunately, you'll have some of these perpetrators harm police dogs. Uh, they will do that. So we signed legislation a couple years ago to make sure that emergency service vehicles like ambulances can also transport injured canines, police canines, to a veterinary clinic to ensure that they get the care that they need. And that can save the lives of some of these canines, just having that. We've also signed legislation increasing penalties on those who harass, injured, or kill a police canine. We view them going after canines as them going after us, and we're going to throw the book at them when they do that. Now, when the canines, obviously we all have our terms of service, uh, when the canines get to the point where they are retiring from the force, uh, a lot of times the handlers will adopt them or other people will want to adopt the, the dogs. You know, the problem is, is that it is not necessarily uh, easy to do that in terms of some of the medical costs. So we launched a program a couple years ago uh, to ensure that caregivers of retired police canines uh, received the stipend to cover the veterinary bills. Uh, and today I'm proud to announce that in less than two years, uh, we already have 86 retired police dogs that have found good homes and received veterinary care at no charge to the owner. And that makes a big difference. Yeah, that's good, isn't it? You know, you, you're going to be taken care of. You don't got to worry about anything. It's all good. 
so, so all that brings me to today's legislative action. I'm signing a couple pieces of legislation, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. And you know, why, why are these, these bills necessary? Well, um, one of the th reasons I think they're necessary are, is this issue that just happened uh, with you know, the media is running that there were 96 shots fired. Uh, and they're trying to put the police officers under the gun. So you see these headlines, and they're trying to cause um, division in society. They're trying to create a narrative. They know what they're doing. And sometimes you've got to read like eight paragraphs down, and then when you admit that this guy was shooting at the police officers first. So how are you in a situation where it's at all controversial to have a criminal suspect shooting at and hitting one of the police officers, firing shots, and they're not supposed to be able to respond in kind. They not only have a right to respond in kind, they have a duty to respond in kind when somebody is using lethal force against them. So how this is trying to be packaged into some narrative against the police officers, and they're trying to de-emphasize the fact that this guy shot, I think he shot his entire magazine because he shot at least 10 shots, so it was 10 to 12 shots he was shooting. So then, of course, these other officers are, are going to respond in kind. That just shows you, though, what I think people in uniform can be up against. Because whether you did the right thing is not what some of these folks in the media care about. The media cares about is, is can they contort that in a way that is going to cause titillation, that's going to get more clicks, that's going to drive more viewership, that's going to cause more controversy. And they're perfectly willing to use uh, a faithful law enforcement officer uh, who's, who's done it by the book. They're totally willing to, to throw that person under the bus if they think it can further the narrative. And the facts don't matter uh, to these folks. And we've seen it time and time again in some of these situations. So, so this is the context that I think that we're dealing with here when we're talking about that. And the fact that that was portrayed the way it has been in some of these media outlets um, has been really, really disturbing uh, to try to de-emphasize the fact that this guy fired on the police first. So we're going to do a couple, a couple bills that uh, I think provides uh, support for people who are wearing the uniform and recognizes that, you know, we've got some, some, some strange currents going on in our society right now uh, that really seek to delegitimize law enforcement and what they're doing. So the first bill, uh, SB 184, uh, is going to prohibit the harassment of a police officer or first responder when they're actively doing their job. You shouldn't be in a situation where you're at a traffic stop, uh, you're responding to, to a call of someone in distress, and then you have people come trying to interdict or trying to harass you from performing your, your duty. Uh, so if you do that, you know, we view that as a problem, and now you're going to be held accountable. The other bill is HB 601, uh, and what it's going to do is it really puts the kibosh on these extrajudicial um, uh, uh, investigations against law enforcement. They'll set up these things called citizen review boards, usually in these very tilted politically jurisdictions. They'll stack it with activists, and they'll just start reviewing things and trying to put people under the gun, even if there's no basis uh, to do that. So we view that as very much a political weapon. We don't think that that will contribute to public safety at all. In fact, we think that that would hurt public safety. Uh, and so this bill uh, really stops that from happening. If you have review boards, that's fine, but it's got to be done in ways uh, where you have the sheriff or chief of police appointing people because the sheriffs and the chief of police, they have an interest in ensuring uh, that their personnel are conducting themselves appropriately as well. I mean, good order and discipline is very important, uh, but it can't be people that have an agenda. So this bill is going to do that. Uh, I think it's going to be something that is going to uh, give peace of, more peace of mind to people who are wearing the uniform. And that was the one thing that I hear when people come from some of these jurisdictions and move to Florida, get the bonus, and then they start serving, is they just have the, the radical difference. Yes, we have lower taxes, you know, the weather, all that stuff. But it's, they felt that they were, the deck was stacked against them, that people wanted them to fail in their former jurisdictions, and they feel that they have a lot of support from the state, from the local government and from the community here in the state of Florida. And that makes a huge difference. That's my morale is higher in Florida than it is in a lot of these jurisdictions. So we're going to keep it going. 
Uh, thank, I want to thank the members of the legislature who are here today. Also thank those who, who could not be with us here today who were involved in passing uh, this legislation. I think that if you look at the run we've had over the last uh, several years, uh, I don't think there's anyone that can match uh, what we've done uh, to protect the citizens of this state, uh, but particularly to ensure that uh, we respect and protect the men and women who wear the uniform. So, all right, we're going to hear from some of our folks now. So I will first uh, bring up uh, Mark Glass, and then we'll hear from some of the other folks. Thank you, Governor. I appreciate that. We are so fortunate to live in a state with a governor who champions our first responders. Can I get a... We talk about law enforcement a lot, but we also have our correctional and probation officers that the governor supports and our legislators support. We have our emergency medical and our fire department. They have to show up on scene when things are called. A lot of times the fire truck and the emergency medical uh, service gets there before we do. And they have to almost stabilize a scene while stabilizing a patient. And sometimes you're, the anxiety's up, people are around it, and they have to say get back while they work on the patient to save lives. So this bill will help them on that. Senate Bill 184 is a great piece of legislation because we have officers that have to deal with uh, protests and then we have to effect an arrest with somebody who is committing a crime during the protest. Then you have people around that officer that is also trying to dissuade them. And a part of that is impede, harass, or threaten while they're still trying to subdue this person so people can have a peaceful protest and get them out of the way. So this, I want to commend the legislation for pushing this forward, and Governor, thank you for taking this on and spearheading this, because we saw on TV with the New York police officers trying to subdue a guy to arrest him, and then you have people, illegal aliens coming in and, and trying to take shots at him. I mean, that's just uncalled for in our streets. And in the state of Florida, you're in a common sense state. So our firefighters have to deal with this, EMS has to deal with this, and they can give testimony through their career. So Senate Bill 184 is I appreciate that. It's a great thing. Let's talk about House Bill 608, 601. This is another one. We have been doing law enforcement or criminal justice reform in this state for decades. I just wish I read ACLU's uh, comment today saying this would impede the uh, community uh, with the law enforcement. I'd say I wish ACLU would get things right instead of get it wrong. If they would pay attention to how our state works, we have review boards. We have the Criminal Justice Standard and Training Commission that deals with every incident that's referred, that's mandatory referred by state statute over to them. And that body looks at them for moral character. Every agency has an internal affairs, and if they don't, they utilize another agency's internal affairs to investigate an incident, whether it is uh, to see if it's criminal or non-criminal of the officer that it's involved with. So right there is several different ways. Also, too, let's talk about the policies and, and procedures. Policies and procedures are done. Almost every agency within the state of Florida are accredited through the state accreditation, and that's what they look at, policies and procedures. So I commend this legislation, House Bill 601, establishing these uh, oversight boards for looking at policies and procedures because that's where it starts at, the policies and procedures. If they violate the policies and procedures, they're held accountable by their, by their agency. These men and women do not need to be scrutinized again and again by a committee that has no idea of what they're talking about. And on the 601, it requires them to have a law enforcement retiree at least on that board from three to seven people. That's fairness. And that's what this state does is fairness. So I just want to say commend the legislators. Thank you for this great legislation. Governor, I always tell everybody I have the best job in the world, but I really don't. I wish I was a canine handler because this is <laughs> awesome. Uh, I, that is the best job in the world, but I want to thank you for your leadership and having our back always. Thank you, sir. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Governor, legislature, commissioner, uh, my fellow commissioners, of course, here in the Board of County Commissioners, of course, my fellow chiefs here and the entire SJSO personnel. Thank you for being here this morning at the St. John's County Sheriff's Office. Uh, Florida Legislature and Governor, you have once again set the gold standard in the United States of America, and you've proved, you continue to prove, and set the standard that we live in the most friendly, law enforcement friendly state in the United States of America, and you continue to do this. With the signing of Senate Bill 184, it just simply puts an exclamation point behind 
of what Back the Blue truly means in the state of Florida. You never know what you can encounter when uh, uh, responding to a call for service. And this isn't just go for the St. John's County Sheriff's Office and all my fellow brothers and sisters that wear this uniform. This goes for these two chiefs that sit here today in front of you with St. John's County Fire and Rescue, which is Chief McGee and Chief Avalese with St. Augustine Fire Department. This protects those men and women, too, that wear the same uniform and provide the same services. And what this does is it sets up that boundary, that protective area around us, so we can do our jobs. We're blessed in the St. John's County where we have this partnership and relationship with our community that stand behind the blue just like you, Governor. And with that being said, this simply just gives us the law and gives us that latitude to enforce something that someone doesn't want to listen, doesn't want to pay attention as we continue to do our jobs. So again, with Senate Bill 184, it simply gives us the power to enforce. Again, Governor DeSantis, I truly, I can't thank you enough. I can't thank you enough for your friendship, for everything you've done, your steadfast support of not only your profession, but what you, our profession, but what you do for my wife, Kendall, and I. Thank you for what you do. You don't just stand behind us, Governor. This is what you do, by the way. This is what the entire United States of America watches, what Florida does. This is what the governor does. He stands alongside of us. When I say he stands behind us, he doesn't. He stands alongside of us, neck and neck with us, shoulder to shoulder, doing the right thing and making this the best place to live, work, play, and raise a family. Thank you. Thank you for your... Thank you for your support, Governor, and everything that you do to make this the greatest state in the nation. Thank you, Governor. Okay. Who's next? Whoever, come on up. Yep. Thank you, Governor. Good morning. My name is Wyman Duggan. Uh, I represent House District 12, uh, right next door in Duval County. It's a pleasure to be here with you this morning. Uh, so I'm the primary sponsor for HB 601, which we're here to uh, sign today. Thank you, Governor. Uh, there's been a lot of, uh, I think, incorrect information out um, in the public about what this bill does and what it doesn't do. So there are 21 jurisdictions in the state of Florida that have some form of civilian review board, civilian oversight. Uh, and what this, what this bill does is say that those boards and commissions and any new ones can no longer receive, pro receive process, or investigate complaints of misconduct against individual law enforcement officers because there are already at least six or seven different forms and venues where that can occur. Uh, what it, they can still meet, they can still talk about policy, procedure, training, culture, systemic issues, but what they cannot do is use them as a vehicle to persecute our law enforcement officers, which to many of these organizations is the only utility that they think that organization has. And so when you hear people saying that uh, these boards and commissions are being you know, prohibited or abolished, that's not true. But to their mind, they think it is because for them, its only purpose is to drag these law enforcement officers through the public square uh, uh, and the media for um, the purpose of humiliation and persecution. The process is the punishment in their minds, and we are not going to allow that any longer in the state of Florida. So thank you, Governor. I appreciate uh, your support. I want to commend uh, Steve Zona, the president of the uh, state fraternal order of police, for championing this issue and bringing it to my attention. It's been a wonderful opportunity to partner with you uh, on this bill. Thank you. Governor. Yep. Good morning, everyone. My name is Alex Rizzo. I am uh, a representative uh, from District 112 down in a little part of the state, Miami-Dade County, and uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be here with you all today. So the, the genesis of uh, what I lovingly refer to as the HALO Bill, SB 184, um, started when I was running four years ago for, the, for this office, and I saw what was going on with the monetization, basically, of interactions with police. And it was people that would just get up into an officer's face who was on duty, put that uh, camera right up in there, and for no reason other than to harass them, uh, was basically putting this back onto social media, monetizing these interactions. I was disgusted with that, frankly. And so I sat down with my, my longtime friend. He's like a brother to me, Al Palacio, who is the district director for FOP. And I don't know where he is. Is he here somewhere? There he is. Al Palacio. We sat down at our favorite pizza, pizza place in our hometown of Hialeah, and we started talking about it. And I said, what, what does step back mean when a police officer says that to someone? And he said, well, it's sort of subjective. And so I said, what do you mean subjective? We've got to put something to that. We've got to make something, we have to make that mean something. 
And so we started drawing on a napkin, actually, and he's got the napkin. I think I, I saw it last night. Um, and I said, well, there's got to be a protective halo around law enforcement. And I, I figured it would make sense. Um, I think that every single person that's standing here, every single person that has ever put on a badge is a guardian angel. Because instead of running from horror, they run towards the horror and protect the rest of us. And so that was the genesis of what I lovingly refer to as the halo bill. And then when I first was elected and I met the governor, the governor would come up to me and go, hey, what's up with that bill? And I said, well, we're working on it. And then the next session would come by, hey, what's up with that bill? I said, we're working on it, governor. We're getting it there. But with leaders such as the first prime co, who's also from up here, uh, the prime co-sponsor of the bill, uh, Representative Garrison, um, who was former prosecutor and a dear friend of mine, and we started working together on this. And we worked with leaders like Representative Leak, Representative Payne, Representative Duggan. We started working on this, and we kept working and working and working. Now, four sessions later, it finally came through fruition. So I want to thank uh, the Speaker of the House, Paul Renner, uh, for his support, uh, Chair Perez, Danny Perez, and again, I already mentioned uh, Chair, uh, Chair Garrison, and also our Senate sponsor, Senator Avila, who also carried that in the Senate, and also the Lieutenant Governor, and of course the Governor's support all this way, because this is, like he said, like the Commissioner said, this is a common sense bill, and this is a bill about safety, and overall, again, it's about protecting, protecting the public, but also protecting every single person that wears that badge every single day. Thank you. Thank you, sir. morning everybody so I'm here to talk about um, the recruiting signing bonus I was actually one of the ones that was blessed enough to receive that signing bonus thank you governor DeSantis so um, that is a very beneficial thing in my behalf because um, so when I was in the Academy my transmission in my car broke down so now I had to rely on my wife to which at the time she was my fiance she brought me day in day out to the Academy eight-hour day along with her going to full time on her job every day. She's also in the military. Um, then her transmission blew out. So now we're down to no car. So we actually had some people in our corner. My, my dad, her dad allowed us to utilize their vehicles until we were able to get things situated. So once we got that, uh, once I got that signing bonus, I was able to get my car fixed. So now we got back up to one vehicle. Now we can return that. Um, so again, thank you for that. So. <laughs> Um, and again, you know, after that, here I am with the St. Johns County Sheriff's Office. Um, I want to thank Sheriff Harwick, Director Beaver, for allowing me to be sponsored to make it through the academy. I wouldn't be here without them. Um, I want to thank also my old sergeant, Sergeant York, because I started in uh, the police athletic league with uh, the Sheriff's Office. And uh, also my uh, corporal, Michelle Lima, she's in here somewhere. Um, they trained me up also while I was in the academy because I was still, you know, working for PAL along the way. Um, they made sure I was up to par with everything, made sure my knowledge was good, made sure my attire was good. Um, and then a lot of people don't know too, back then I had dreads that was like all the way down here. <laughs> so one day, you know, Sheriff, you know, Sheriff, he was recruiting me for about two years. So I actually started coaching with him at Pedro Menendez High School, coaching football. And uh, you know, he was just like, come on, man, you know, it's a good place to work. Let's go ahead. Come, come work for us, you know? I'm just like, oh, I don't know if I wanna be a deputy. So then he's like, all right, you don't have to make that decision now. Why don't you just come work for uh, PAL, Police Athletic League? I'm like, all right, cool. Still doing what I love, coaching, mentoring kids and everything. So long story short, we're, I wanna say, halfway through a football game versus uh, Marion County. We're on the sideline, we're down by like six points. And he, uh, he's in the game. Next thing you know, I'm randomly, I just cross my arms. I look at him, I was like, hey, uh, I think I wanna be a deputy. And then he looked at me, brushed it off, and he was like, wait, what'd you just say? <laughs> so I'm like, yeah. He was like, wait, all right, he was like, we'll, we'll talk about this tomorrow. So uh, we finished the conversation up, you know, and he was like, what changed? And I was like, I mean, honestly, I really don't know, but I think it was being in a police athletic league, being around everybody, all cops. So, I mean, it's like, I mean, I'm getting the best of both worlds. So, and also, a lot of people don't know, my mom, she was actually a correction officer in New Jersey for 18 years. So I'm like, Kudos to you for that. I don't want to be in the jail. I'd rather take my chances on the street. So, uh, <laughs> so, um, but again, uh, I want to thank them for allowing me to be here. And again, thank you, Governor DeSantis, for allowing me to receive that recruiting bonus. All right, so, good job. Right.
All right, well, we'll have um, the folks who are going to participate in the bill signing. You can kind of come up and gather around, and we'll do, uh, we'll do both of these bills. What breed is that? Bloodhound. Bloodhound. Yeah, probably got a really good sniffer on that. <laughs> <laughs> Got that bloodhound behind me, so, so I would not want to have drugs on me with that thing. I mean, <laughs> that, that thing will sniff anything out. Um, so, so we're excited about uh, It's been a great week, if you think of what we've been able to do with uh, support advancing public safety. We started with some fentanyl legislation on Monday. Uh, we signed legislation to combat the retail theft. And you think in Florida, it's actually down. A lot of these other places, they're looting stores left and right. And you have these retail theft rings, internet flash mobs that they try to do. Uh, so that ends in Florida with the signing of that bill. Uh, then, of course, today uh, we're here with, uh, with, with the really important stuff. So, so it's been a good week, and we'll continue to, uh, to do. We've got a lot of other pieces of legislation in the hopper. We're going through the budget. Uh, I think it's going to end up being a, a good budget year. Like, look, I'm going to have to pare back some of the spending in the budget because that's just what we have to do to make sure that we're fiscally responsible. But I think when we uh, get to John Hancock on that and all the other pieces of legislation, I think people are going to look and say, okay, um, you're the number one state for GDP growth over the last five years, lowest per capita debt in the United States. Lowest, second lowest per capita state tax burden in the United States, um, lowest unemployment amongst large states uh, by far, uh, budget surplus, paid down 25% of the state's debt over the last five years, and yet are still managing to have record support for education, environmental restoration, infrastructure. In fact, we did the Moving Florida Forward, which is pumping additional billions in to accelerate some of these projects, which weren't even scheduled to start till next decade. Now they're going to be done 10, 15 years ahead of schedule. So uh, uh, I put, we put that up against anyone. I mean, clearly there's a lot of states that are having much, uh, having a lot of trouble, even doing basic things, um, and we're getting it. We're getting it done. So we're proud of that. Okay, we have any questions? Yes, uh, Governor. Um, the Biden administration yesterday announced a new rule that proposed. Uh, to close the gun show loophole what kind of impact there is no gun this is this is typical <laughs> propaganda if i have a gun store and you come in you're required to run a background check if i bring my my inventory to a gun sh show i still have to do the same thing as a ffl there's no difference between a gun show and being in your store and so that is something that, that really, I think, is a myth. Clearly, they don't have legislation. They need legislation if they're going to do anything. So it's another example of Biden just acting through executive fiat. He got, uh, he's going to get struck down finally when the whole pistol brace rule, that's unilateral. He does not have authority to do this. So, and the same thing with the student loan bailout. 
you know, I'm somebody, I think the colleges should be responsible to back the student loans because they really benefited with these kids going into debt. So I'm not unsympathetic to it, but I'm not supportive of telling a truck driver he's got to pay the student loan for someone that got a degree in gender studies. That is not right. And so, but that's a debate you have legislatively. What Biden, he's already gotten slapped down on it. Now he's getting slapped down again. He's going to get, I think it's, but he's doing the same thing basically, um, abusing uh, law. If this, if this was something he could have done, why didn't he do it on day one? Because people know that. So I think that this is an example of you know, who governs our society? We have a constitutional system that was enacted at this country shortly after this country's founding. And it's very clear on who has the power to legislate, who is charged with executing those laws. Uh, what Biden is doing, and he's not the first president to do it, but what he's doing uh, is he's taken the bureaucracy and, and this fourth branch of government, and he's using that to legislate without popular consent. Uh, and that's wrong. That is not the way uh, we're supposed to be governed. And in this instance, it's obviously on a false premise because people that have gone to gun shows know when you buy a fight, you do go through background checks. They can't just, they're not exempt from it just because they happen to be uh, at, at a gun show. Uh, and that's been the law for, for a long, long time. But it's a, it's a symptom of a larger problem of governing by executive fiat, uh, doing these executive orders through the bureaucracy when you can't get this done through Congress. Do you imagine that rule will impact private gun sales here in Florida? I think it'll get challenged immediately, and I think it'll end up getting nixed because, look, they, they have debated legislating in this field for a long time, and they've not done it. So what? You have those, was that just window dressing, and yet a president can go issue uh, new things? But let's just be clear on these gun shows because you have these narratives and these talking points. Um, you go to a gun show... Uh, and those, all those people that are set out there with that, like every one of them must do a background check before they sell you the gun. That's just the truth. What they're talking about has nothing to do with gun shows. They're talking about if you as a private citizen uh, sell a rifle to your cousin, do you have to do a background check on that? And the law does not currently require that. that. That is true. That has nothing to do with gun shows specifically. That's just a recognition that if someone's, you know, because the, the, the Schumers of the world, they want to say, if you give a rifle, for, uh, like if a brother gives a, his, uh, if someone gives his brother a rifle, that they have to do a background check before they could just, just loan that if they go hunting or something. And what they're trying to do is really crimp the ability to exercise Second Amendment rights, which, oh, by the way, you know, we've stood up for in the state of Florida. Governor, with Governor, relation to House Bill 601, if Florida is the free state, shouldn't its citizens be free as they see fit to oversee those who could arrest them? Well, they're not free to use law enforcement as political pinatas. They're not free to create false narratives. They're not free to try to make it miserable to live uh, or to, to work in uniform. And, and these things are highly political. But as you heard uh, Wyman say, they can still do, they can do whatever, but they're not able to initiate disciplinary proceedings. We have other ways to do that. Uh, all the law enforcement personnel, they have the leadership, they have an interest in having discipline. It does not do good for them if people are not doing it by the book. Um, and I know sometimes people think that like somehow they don't want to do that. They do want to do that. It will not end well for them if they let everyone just run loose and not play by the book. And I think these guys all know that. But um, these things have been political tools. So, yeah, they can meet. They can exercise whatever First Amendment. Free. They're not going to have any right. Uh, to initiate disciplinary proceedings, and that's a very firm line that they've drawn on this bill, and I think that that's the appropriate line. Yes, sir. Uh, it really wasn't anything that was coming from me. There was a lot of concern out of one county, Miami-Dade, and um, I don't think it was an issue in any other part of the state. I think they were pursuing something that was going to cause a lot of problems down there. So I think a lot of the members of the Dade delegation uh, created uh, that just to, to steer clear of those problems. But it really is related mostly to that one county down in, down in Miami-Dade. I've not seen that be an issue through, through the rest of the parts of the state. Uh, Governor, any chance the Democratic CEO appoints the new JTA board members anytime soon? So um, I had a meeting on our appointments uh, yesterday. We're, we're, we're working hard to do. I mean, sometimes, you know, when you have some of these um, vacancies, 
people got to apply. There's a process. You got to run vets. And so it's, it's not as easy as just saying, hey, yeah, go ahead and get on there. Uh, so, so we are doing it. Um, I've, I've been reviewing kind of the progress of it. So I would expect something relatively soon. Uh, but I don't, I'm not prepared to make, a, make any uh, appointments today, uh, but, but hopefully we'll be able to do it in the not too distant future. Well, listen, um, we want to be back. Uh, we're going to be back in Jacksonville soon, uh, some of our education stuff, which I think is really exciting, what we've been able to do this year. And um, I think if you look overall about uh, you know, what's happened over these many years, you know, you've got a lot of folks in Northeast Florida that, that, have, that have done a lot. Uh, for the state and the legislature and delivered a lot of really big wins for the people, not just in Northeast Florida, but all of Florida, but particularly some of the things that they've been able to do here. So, so you guys should feel good uh, that you got some good folks up there in Tallahassee that are fighting for you uh, and that are delivering some, some really big wins that are gonna, that are gonna continue to make this area a great place to go. I mean, I saw, did you see the rankings where they said the, the top cities for um, where, where they're hiring, particularly you know, good jobs, Jacksonville? Uh, I mean, I think four of the five were Florida, or three of the five were Florida, but Jacksonville, I think, was number one uh, in that ranking. So I think that that's really, really testament to the good job people have done here. So let's keep it up. Thanks, everybody. God bless. All right. Thanks, guys.